Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to EBC. Uh, my name is Steve Ruffner, and I'm one of the pastors here. And I, too, would like to extend a welcome to all of our returning students, and especially to their families who are here in that emotional drop-off. Uh, I had the, the privilege of experiencing that a little bit this weekend myself as I was taking my daughter onto campus for the first time this semester, and as we were pulling onto to campus, seeing the whole, you know, all the welcoming committee and, and their matching shirts and everything, and as we turned onto the street, everybody's cheering, and that was all exciting, and like, it was emotional, like, this is really great. And especially for us, because because we were just going to Chick-fil-A, and so I was like, wow, this is great business here. Like, like what, a, what a welcome to go to Chick-fil-A. So um, my daughter's a senior in high school, so we might be experiencing that for real next year, but uh, this time around, it was just for Chick-fil-A, but um, true story. So, but welcome. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with us to Titus chapter 3. And as you're doing that, how many of you watched the Field of Dreams baseball game earlier this week? How many of you even know what I'm talking about? Field of Dreams baseball game. So from the movie Field of Dreams, you know, they were playing in the cornfield. You know, if they build it, they will come. And this year, they actually played a game in that field, which was, was a really exciting game. Probably the best thing for Major League Baseball in a long time especially considering how the Yankees got beat in the bottom of the ninth. That was fabulous. But um, I'm a Tiger fan and a fan of any team playing the Yankees. So sorry if you're a Yankees fan. But um, I love the sport of baseball. Uh, it's one of those sports where an individual can excel in what they do, yet still be helpful, important part of the team. Um, but it really is never about just one player. Like any team that's going to excel has to do so as a team. Individual success often does help a team win, but a team will not win in the long term unless they are working together and playing together and actually coordinating their entire efforts to, to succeed. And the same is true within the church. If we're going to represent Jesus in this world the way that we should, carrying out the mission that we as a church have been called to do, then we need to work together as a unified body. The church is important. We're not a bunch of individual players who are doing our own thing the own, our own way. But unfortunately, in our culture, as we all know, we like to emphasize the individual's needs, the individual's desires, our own preferences. Um, and sometimes that spills over into the church. Um, some people believe that, that they can really have a meaningful relationship with the Lord and yet somehow neglect the responsibilities that God has given them as a part of his church. Some believe that they can be committed to Jesus, but not be committed to his church. You know, those people are fine clocking in the average one or two Sundays per month that most Christians tend to do. But they're reluctant to commit to anything or any involvement beyond that. So I, I really liked what, what was said at the start of the service about how we need to be involved in serving and being a part of the church. But too often, I hear things like, you know, I can't get involved in this midweek Bible study, or I can't serve as a Sunday school teacher. You know, I'm just busy. I work. I have friends. There are places I want to go, things I want to do. I just have a life. Besides, you know, I can get all the spiritual input and nourishment that I need from this podcast or from this website or for the, this Christian radio station. And the reality is God has given us the church for our blessing, for his glory, but for our protection, 
for our delight and for us to have a deeper, meaningful, and intimate relationship with him and with other Christians. And so this is what the book of Titus has been all about. What a healthy church looks like. How does it operate? And how should we as its members live? So if you're just returning or if you're visiting, you're catching us at the very tail end of it because we are closing up this series today. And as you heard, we're going to be starting a new series in Ephesians next week. Um, but, but we're going to wrap up the book of Titus um, and, and hopefully put it all together of what does a healthy church look like and how, how should we live. So... So the other pastors and I really do hope and we've been praying that this series would be an encouragement to you, that it would be a blessing to you, but at the same time, we hope it has been challenging to you. Um, I know um, I walked away last week having had my toes stepped on a little bit and and having been convicted uh, just on some of the ways that I live and think about things, but You know, we've been calling this series a healthy church because just in these three short chapters, it outlines what a healthy church looks like. So in chapter one, we learned how we as a church need to have the right perspective on this life and of God. Chapter one also talks about how the church is to have ready and qualified leaders Chapter 2, we talked about how we as a redeemed family should interact with one another and how we have things to learn and we all have things to contribute. We are also reminded that we are redeemed people through Jesus Christ. And then last week, as we did the first part of chapter 3, we learned about our renewed witness. What are the marks of God's people? the marks of unbelievers, and what gospel transformation can do. So, so today we're, we're at the end of chapter 3, and the book is going to come to a close. And so we're just going to look at the last three bits of instruction uh, that Paul gives to Titus and gives to us as a church. Um, so yeah. So hopefully you're in chapter 3. We're going to be looking starting in verse 9. Um, So if you haven't turned there, go ahead and do that now, and let me pray to get us started. Father, we come before you this morning grateful that you have saved us, and that you have given us your son, um, that, that because of the cross, that we have this wonderful joy and privilege of being a part of your church. Because of the cross, our sins can be forgiven. That we have hope for this life and for the next. And so God, we thank you for the promise that your spirit is here with us today. um, And that you, you desire for us to be more like your son. And so God, I pray that you would Be at work in our hearts to hear what you would want us to hear. God, please don't let me get in the way of your message. Speak to us. So, Jesus, we love you and we thank you. We pray this in, in your name. Amen. So one of the recurring themes throughout the book of Titus has been this idea of doing good. Actually, it's mentioned at least seven times in these 46 verses. And as a church, we've kind of picked up on this this theme a little bit and have encouraged us all to memorize one of the key passages in it. So how many of us have at least taken a little bit of time to attempt to learn this? That's exciting. I'm I'm glad some of us have have done that. Uh, If you wouldn't mind, could we all stand and we're going to read this together. Um, Sorry, I don't have a gift card for somebody willing to to come up and say it this time. But uh, so this is our our last chance to do it together. So if you have it memorized, 
Go ahead and do it with your eyes closed. Or not. Go ahead, Go ahead and read it with us. Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for that blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Great, thank you. You can be seated. So we, we felt that those few verses uh, summarizes this entire book in a way um, that no other than the passage do. Just what we are called to do as a church and how we are called to live. So. So here we are, Titus chapter 3, here at the very end. These are Paul's final written words to Titus. And they describe the healthy church as one where the people are resolved defenders of what is good and what is true. So I was told the last time I, that I spoke that it was helpful that I gave all of my fill-in-the-blank notes there at the very beginning. I think that was because when the person woke up, all their notes were already filled in, so they didn't feel like they missed anything. So... Anyway, whether or not that's the reason or that works, I'm going to do that anyway. So if you have your notes and your bullets, and go ahead and pull those out. And I'm going to give you all of the blanks that you need to fill in. And then we're going to go back and flesh those out a little bit. So here, the, this last part of Titus 3, Paul is giving his final three instructions to Titus. And I summarize them this way. The first one is to avoid distractions. So don't tolerate division and be devoted to doing good. I know you're like, there's extra blanks in there. What's going on? All right, so here's what those extra blanks are. So along with avoiding distractions, the idea of that is to stay on mission. Then don't tolerate division. The importance of that is to maintain unity. And then the last one is that we should work together. So you have those, all that filled in? I'll give you a moment. We're going to come back to it anyway. They'll be up there at other times. But. So avoid distractions, don't tolerate division, and be devoted to doing good. So let's look at the first one here, avoiding distractions and staying on mission. So this is the first of the final three instructions that Paul gives to Titus. And it says this here in verse 9. Oops, sorry. No, I went too fast. All right. It should be. There we go. All right, thanks. All right, so the Titus 3 verse 9 says, But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. So before we break down what the text is actually saying here in this verse, I want to point out the conjunction at the beginning of this verse. The but at the beginning of verse 9 links what is being said here in this verse to the thought in the previous verses. Am I doing that? <laughs> is this just a way to keep you awake? Is that what it is? Gosh, so. Did I put a timer on there? Sorry. Sorry, Drew. Rescue me, please. Thank you. How about I just put this aside and I'll do a will and just say next slide, please. How about that? So. All right, you just might have to keep going back and forth. All right, so. Anyway, uh, well, that's one way to really get yourself off, off mission right there. So, yeah, avoid distractions. My goodness. Uh, so the beginning of verse 9 here says, but, starts with that but. 
And it's linking there what is there in verse 9 to what is said right before it. In verse 8, he says, This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently, so that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. So Paul's emphasis here is that the instruction that was just given in that that previous section is good and profitable. And in some ways, Paul would have done really well to just stop his letter right then and there. Like, here, I've given you everything you need to know. This is good and profitable. Let's go. Go. But... Instead, he attacks on a few extra sentences uh, that make up verses 9 through 11 as a way to point out that there are things that can interfere with these good and profitable things. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. So this warning that Paul gives to Titus is a recurring theme for Paul because he writes similar words three different times to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1, he says, Command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work. Later on in that same letter, he says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. In 2 Timothy, he says, don't have anything to do with foolish or stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. There are many things that can distract us from what God has called all of us to do. But Paul lists a few specific things here. Foolish controversies, genealogies, as well as arguments and quarrels about the law. So foolish controversies are generally things for which there is no hope of getting an answer. You know, a silly example of this might be something like, you know, and you've probably heard these, like, you know, so, so how many angels can fit on a head of a pin? Who knows? Who cares? Or, you know, God's all-powerful, right? So can he ever make a rock that is so big that he can't move it? Like, or maybe there are some legitimate theological questions, but any answer to the question might be only speculation without any real biblical foundation. The genealogies is an interesting one because the Bible is full of genealogies, um, and they are important as a way of pointing to Christ, He's not saying that those passages should be ignored. Nor is he picking on anybody who uses Ancestry.com. But in in reality, it's a type of problem that arises when somebody says, well, I'm more spiritual than you because I can trace my family all the way back to King David. Or, you know, I'm more spiritual or I have more clout within the church because, you know, I'm the third cousin of Joseph, the father of Jesus, or, or, or something like that. Or even what Paul mentioned in other passages where people would be appealing to, well, I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Paul, or I'm of this. And he's saying, no, those things aren't important. And people are are trying to elevate their own spirituality, their own place in the church, because of whatever background that they can attribute to themselves. In this day and age, we kind of use something like that a little differently, where we kind of go back in our family history and say, well, I could prove that I'm from some forgotten or marginalized or oppressed people group, and thus I can use that to hold over your head for whatever reason. And these things do tend to be useless within the church. They promote even more division and controversy. 
Now, we'll say this, that not all controversies are foolish, right? For example, what if somebody came into our church and started saying, well, you know, all religions are the same, and all roads lead to heaven. That's a controversy worth engaging in. Because not only is that statement wrong and contrary to the teaching of the Bible, like Jesus said in John 14, where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So to say that all religions are the same and that all roads lead to heaven can't be right. And so a statement like that is not just wrong, it's dangerous because it leads people down the wrong path. And so you need to engage in things like that. Or if you think about the Arian controversy back in the early 300s that said that Jesus wasn't God, that he was created, that he was finite. And that controversy led to the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD and the Nicaean Creed that many churches still recite today. Some controversies are important because they help us clarify what is true and what we should be acting on in our beliefs. But unfortunately, we can still get distracted by things like that today. You know, every church has had its splits over little things like music style or dress code or leadership models or the kind of carpet that we have or the color of the paint, or what food we serve on our community meals. And then even when it comes to theology, we can get involved in arguments where we get hung up on the tiniest letter of the law, but then we miss out on the entire point of what was being said. Paul gives two very good reasons to avoid these foolish things, is that they're unprofitable and they're useless. Basically, what he's saying is when you finish these arguments, whatever you're engaged in, you've pretty much just wasted your time. As my wife likes to say, you cannot be rational with irrational people. Usually she's saying that to me and I'm the irrational one. But uh, Titus was to completely avoid these disagreements. He was to focus on keeping the main thing the main thing and to move ahead with the mission of the church. And Paul told Titus to avoid them, to shun them, to turn around and walk away from them. And just like Titus, we as a church cannot get sidetracked by engaging in every argument someone wants to have. I remember when I was in seminary, and this isn't the best of examples, because to some degree this is important uh, on, on bigger scales, but I remember this was my first year taking the class on the Pentateuch, and we spent weeks talking over the, the textual criticism thing about the JEDP. And for those of you who don't know what that is, you're welcome. Um, but it, it's, it's this textual criticism of what is the source documents of who actually wrote the first five books of, of the Bible. And there is some value in, in looking at that and in, in understanding where these arguments might come from. And, but I, I remember sitting there in the class thinking, who talks about stuff like this? And why are we talking about this? Like so few people look at the Bible in, in such a way to even think about that when I really, I want them to know what the Bible says. And it, it was one of those things that it, it frustrated me so much with seminary that I felt like we were going down these, these tangent type issues rather than talking about the actual stuff that after the first year and a half, I decided to take the time off and actually just get involved in doing some ministry stuff and telling people about Jesus. Like, like this stuff seemed like it was such a sidetrack issue. 
Now, after about 10, 15 years off, and finally engaging in some people who had some questions about that, it was good that I had that knowledge, but it was one of those, like, there are things out there that people will want to talk to you about that are just meant to push off the issue. I remember so many times I will talk with people about my faith, and the question that they'll raise is, well, yeah, I know, that, that's interesting, but what about the person in, you know, the middle of Africa who's never heard it? Like, you know, what about that person? And that's a good question to ask. But really, probably for that person, it's meant to be a distraction. Because the question for them really is, but what about you? You have heard. What are you going to do with this? And so they want to engage in some argument about some theoretical thing rather than engaging with the point and the truth that is right there in front of them. And that's really a part of the heart of what Paul is getting here is don't allow yourself to go off on these tangents. Don't allow yourself to be distracted. Stay on mission. Talk about the things that are worth talking about. So spending time doing the things that are profitable and useful. Do the things that are beneficial and uplifting and that build us up in the faith. All right, Drew, can you move me on to the next one, please? So the second instruction is in the next two verses, and it says, don't tolerate division. And that's just maintaining unity. It says, warn a divisive person once, and then warn him a second time, and after that, have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. See, division within the church is the quickest way to get us off track of our mission and to pull us away to doing things that we shouldn't be doing. You know, few people actually like con confrontation. You know, nobody really enjoys warning other people of things that they're doing wrong. But there are times when it must be done. Paul says that it's important to confront and to warn somebody who's going down that path. And then he says, if you need to warn them a second time, warn them a second time. And if they're still being divisive, have nothing to do with that person. So long before Abner Doubleday or whoever it was that invented baseball, or long before Bill Clinton's three strikes and your outlaws, Paul says... Once, twice, and a third time you're out. This is church discipline. Now the term divisive person could be translated as a heretic. And this is a person who's teaching false doctrines, false things about God and salvation, like the examples that I had mentioned before. This could be a person who's living an immoral, an openly immoral lifestyle and flaunting their immoral behavior. Or maybe this is just a person who's always just stirring up trouble. They're the one who are always going and complaining about the music or the paint or the programs or the leadership. And not doing it in a way trying to correct it, just doing it to complain. See, a healthy church actually is one that will have its occasional disagreements with each other. But they're able to do it maturely, and they're able to do it properly, and able to move past disagreements to focus on what is important. But when sin enters the church, it causes all sorts of division. Division over right theology, division over how to live out our faith, division over how we are to treat one another. Now, the Bible is abundantly clear how we are to handle these types of divisions and how we are to handle the people that are causing them. For the sake of time, I won't go through all the passages in detail, uh, but 
But I encourage you to write these down and go back and look at them at another time. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. It explains the process of how we are to warn a person and what we are to do if they don't listen. 2 Thessalonians 3.14 says that if someone doesn't follow the instructions that are given, that you're not supposed to associate with them. 1 Corinthians 5, 4-13 says that when a person who claims to know Jesus is living in open sin, that we shouldn't be interacting with them, that we should expel them. And these types of church discipline issues are contrary to the, the way that we think that should be. Like, we want to show grace upon grace, and we want to warn them, but then we want to keep, keep, I don't know, loving on them in such a way that keeps them close, so hoping that somehow that our love on them is going to help them see the light. But the Bible is really clear. That after warning people, especially those who are in the church who claim the name of Christ, and they continue to live in such a way that is contrary to it, that we are to not associate with them. Now, people who don't claim the name of Christ, who continue to live in sin, we're supposed to accept them. We're supposed to allow that. It's okay. Because people who don't claim Christ are supposed generally Don't live like Christians. So we accept them and we love them and we show them grace. But when somebody says that they're a Christian and they continue to not live like a Christian after being warned, the most loving and gracious thing that we could do is to cut them off in hopes that they would see that they have pulled away from the church. In hopes that they would see that they're removed from the the community and the safety of the, the church body, and that they would come back. And we are trusting the Holy Spirit to be at work in their life and not us and our ability to, to love on them in such a way that the Scripture doesn't tell us to do. I mean, the Bible does say and there in that Thessalonians passage that we don't treat them like they're, they're our enemy. They're not our enemy. But you still don't have the occasion or create the occasion to associate with them. If a person stubbornly chooses to continue in their disruptive behavior after two warnings from the leadership, they should be told that we are not to have anything to do with them. Tony Evans wrote, a church that does not practice church discipline of its members is not functioning properly as a church. Just as a family that does not discipline is not a fully healthy functioning family. I heard it once said that when a church, when church discipline leaves the church, Christ goes with it. But we are not to tolerate divisions or heresies or other things within the church. We are to maintain the unity. And sometimes the unity is maintained when those who are causing the division are not among us. And I know it sounds harsh and judgmental and against everything that many of us have ever um, thought we've been taught. But it is the most gracious and loving thing to do, to allow the Holy Spirit's work in them and to remove them from our midst for the sake of the rest of the body. There's so much more that can be said on this issue, and I'm sure that raises even more questions and answers, but I'm just going to leave it with what the text says. Well, the third and final instruction is that a healthy church is one that is devoted to doing good. That we work together as a church. 
It's on that next slide. And that's in the next couple of verses. And there are three examples of this over the next few verses. But we are supposed to be a church that is devoting, devoted to doing good. John Wesley, the famous uh, Methodist preacher from the 1700s, is quoted as saying, Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. That pretty much covers it all, right? Just do good to everyone all the time. Like I said, so the next four verses that close out this entire letter, we have three examples of what doing good looks like and how the church can work together. So the first one here is in verse 12. It says, As soon as I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, because I have decided to winter there. So I would say the first example of doing good, I, I would categorize it this way, is to hold on loosely. No, it's not the 38 special song, but anyway, hold on loosely. Have you ever been working on a project, and then your boss calls you aside and pulls you off of that project, and put somebody else on it. And then as you're being pulled away, you're, you're, the whole time you're just frustrated. Because like, you know, that was, that was my baby. I was doing that. I, I'm not done with it yet. And you don't want some other Yahoo to come in and mess it up. Or maybe you're serving at the church. You know, you're teaching Sunday school or you're on the worship team. And somebody asks you to step back from that role because they would like you to step in and fill a different role and fill in a need in a different place. And your tendency is like, but no, this is my area of strength, or this is what I want to do, or, or you know, I'm not good at this. You know, I want to be doing this. And there's some value in, in having something and owning it, right? That seems here... The, the sense of how we can work together is to hold on to our roles and our responsibilities loosely. Paul is sending somebody to take over for Titus for a season. It's likely Artemis, in my opinion, since 2 Timothy 4.12 says that Paul sent Tychicus to Ephesus. But we don't know. Maybe Tychicus went there via another route, but... Paul says, when this person gets to Crete, Titus, I want you to come to me. Now, Titus could have said, you know, sorry, Paul, I got a good thing going here in Crete. You know, I know you've given me this big task of getting the churches all organized and everything, but, but I'm not done with it yet. I kind of like what I'm doing. Um, you know, I, I really don't want to come visit you. You know, I know what the winter is like there up in Nicopolis, and I don't want to go. Or maybe he, Titus could have said, you know, well, Paul, I know what kind of things happen to you. You get imprisoned, you get beaten, you get whipped, stoned, shipwrecked, and nah, I'd rather s stick to my safe little environment here in Crete. But we do know that Titus did eventually make his way back to Paul, and then Paul sent him along with Luke to Corinth. Church history also indicates that Titus eventually made his way to modern-day Croatia, where the local church there became a major hub for missionaries being sent throughout the entire world. And certainly that wouldn't have happened if if Titus had said, no, I don't want to go to where you're asking me to come, Paul. So doing good means holding on loosely to our current role, your current status, your current comfort zone, and working together to do or to go whenever and wherever you're needed. 
The second example of doing good is in the next two verses, verses 13 and 14. Do everything you can to help Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive lives. So I would categorize that the second way of doing good is just meeting people's needs. I want to point out just how it's stated there in, in verse 13. Do everything you can to help that they have everything that they need. It seems that Zenos and Apollos came to Crete to deliver this letter to Titus and that they were passing through on their way to some other missionary opportunity. And Paul suggests that the good that Titus can do for these two missionaries is to do everything possible to help them and to meet their needs as they go there on, along their way. Titus is to make sure that they have whatever they need. Food, a place to stay, supplies, money, transportation, encouragement, or anything else that they might need. Now, our church, we support eight different missionaries. And there are others that we are connected to in different ways. The top row up there, you have the Dekines and the Dotsons and the Herods who serve over in Europe in different places, Paris and Strasbourg and in Prague. In the bottom left, you have Sharon Rahali and the Pivisons and Melissa Friesen who are ABWE missionaries, medical missionaries in Togo, West Africa and Bangladesh. And on the right, you have Brent and Tammy Holland, who serve with International Messengers, based out of the States. And you have my family with the International School Project and crew. And I can just speak personally, as a missionary, how valuable it is when our church family and our supporting churches have provided for needs that we have in different ways at different times. The Dunstans have been supporting my family and my ministry for more than 28 years. Started supporting my wife before we got married and they kindly took me in. <laughs> Not that they had much of an option, but they could have dropped us, right? <laughs> And there are many others in our church that support us. And it's such a blessing to know that when there are needs and when there are things going on, that as, just as a missionary, that those needs will be met, that there will be encouragement there, that there will be gifts given, that there will be opportunities that our church and our other supporting churches will come and meet for us. And that's what Paul is telling them here. To meet their needs. To give them what they need as they go on their way. But then he also takes it another step further in verse 14. That they may provide for daily necessities as well for themselves. So he says, first, our people. It's not just Titus' job to meet their needs. It's the job of the entire church. What I like here, he says that they must learn to do this. That kind of echoes back to chapter 2, when everyone, men and women, young and old, slave and free, needed to learn how to interact with one another. And here, the church needs to learn to devote themselves to do what is good in order to meet their own daily needs and the needs of these missionaries. I love the connection between 13 and 14. Because doing good helps 
with them, with the church individuals as families and as, as individuals, that their needs are met and that the lives that they live are productive, but it also is meeting the needs of others as well. And then we come to the very last verse of this book, chapter 15, or verse 15 of chapter 3. And I would categorize this example of doing good in a very simple way of to just love each other. Paul ends the, the letter by writing, Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. We do good when we love each other and we express it. This isn't the kind of love where when you see somebody at Walmart at the other end of the aisle, you conveniently go to a different aisle to avoid them. We've all done it, right? Right? That's not showing love for that person. We express our love for each other. And that's how we, one of the ways that we do good to each other. And I want to close with this. We need to remember that even though doing good is a theme in this book, in this letter, and it's something that we as a church need to learn to do because that's what makes us a healthy church, that doing good is not what saves us. You can do all the good in the world and still miss out on Jesus. We were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, right? But our doing good works don't save us. Earlier in this chapter, verse 5, it says, not by works of righteousness that we've done. So it's not by our good works that we're saved, that we are saved by the mercy of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, which again we're going to get to in our next series, that we are saved by God's grace, not by the things that we've done. And once we're saved, we have an ability, that privilege, we have the, the, the real opportunity to do the good works that we are created to do. So my prayer for us as a church is that we would be active in doing good works. But more so than that, that we would not miss out on Jesus in doing it. That all of us would come to him first. And if you've never given your life to Christ, I urge you to find me or another one of the pastors, Pastor Greg, Van, Will, some of our other leaders in the church, to talk to them. What it means to be a believer, to trust Christ to pay for the, the penalty of your sin. And I want us to be a church that is active in these things. That we are a church who is on mission, that we're avoiding distractions that we will be unified in all things, and that we would be doing good works. So pray with me. Our great God in heaven, thank you. Thank you that you've given us your word in the form of this letter by Paul to Titus for our encouragement for our growth, for know, to challenge us in such a way that we would know about what you have for us and that we would live toward that. Help us as a church to live out all, all that you have for us. I pray this in Christ's name.